We want to look at what international schools are looking for from their suppliers and how suppliers uh, can best build up connections with the international schools. We're going to look at the size of the market, growth projections and what the opportunities might be for edtech businesses. Uh, we're going to look at how to raise your profile within the networks and the associations that operate within the international schools market um, and how to determine which international schools to target for your uh, specific business provision. Uh, we want to understand the different schools. Um, you need to understand the different schools and understand how you can tailor your offer and your product according to their particular requirements. And we want to look at how schools procure, what are the challenges and where do they look. So I'm joined today uh, by a very illustrious panel. Uh, we have, first of all, uh, Duncan Silcott, who's Director of Digital Learning at uh, Brighton College in Abu Dhabi. And then we have uh, Brian Christian, who's principal of the British School in Tokyo. Jamie Ralph is communications officer at COBIS, the Council of British International Schools. And Laurent Fauville is IT director at the Talim group of schools based in Dubai. So before I turn to the panel, I thought I would just give a quick overview of the international schools market. It continues to grow apace and ISC research today has more than 9,300 international schools listed on its database and that's an increase from uh, the number of 2,500 international schools in the year 2000, so it gives you an idea of how the market has grown. There are more than 5 million students at the schools worldwide today and the majority of the schools teach from nursery primary, primary all the way through to age 18. Uh, the schools listed on the ISC research database include state and trust schools, but it is predominantly a for-profit market these days, so most of the schools are private. There are 470,000 teachers at the international schools, and the value of the market in terms of tuition fee income today is 47.3 billion US dollars. So it's a market full of opportunities for businesses like yours. In addition to that, uh, on the database we have 174 schools listed which aren't yet open, due to open over the next two years. So as you can see, growth continues. Now 80% of the students at the international schools these days come from local families, local wealthy families. What is the demand that has really um, led to this massive growth in this particular sector of the education market? Well, it's the demand for uh, an education at university in English at one of the best universities. That's what the parents want and that's what the students want and that really has been uh, the biggest driver behind the growth in the market. It's interesting to note that in 2012, there were four and a half million students studying at university first degree outside of their home country. The prediction is that by 2025 that number will have gone up to eight million students. So again, uh, an indicator that the international schools have a very uh, rosy future ahead of them. The schools, of course, offer a range of curricula. 43% of the schools offer a curricula derived from uh, the British curriculum. Uh, and all of the panellists that are here today are uh, representative of British international schools. Um, and as uh, Duncan said earlier on, um, it really is uh, a, a situation where the schools are looking to British suppliers to service their requirements. There's been a huge growth in bilingual teaching at international schools around the world. Uh, markets like China and the UAE and India and also Latin America are definitely markets to watch. So in terms of forecasts, how is the market going to grow? ISC research forecasts that by 2027 there will be 16,500 international schools around the world. Uh, so the market is set to grow massively. There will be uh, over 10 million students at the schools and almost a million teachers will be required. And the value of the market by 2027 we're forecasting will be 90 billion US dollars. So that gives you a little bit of 
background to the market. Now what I'd like to do is, is turn to the panel uh, and ask them for their views on uh, what the schools are looking for from education supply. So Brian first, if I could ask you, as an international school principal, how is your provision for technology, uh, and that's to support school admin as well as teaching and learning, how has it changed in recent years and how do you anticipate it changing over the next three to four years? Um, I thought you said you only had three quarters of an hour for the whole session. <laughs> uh, that, that's, a, that's a book's worth of, of answer, I think. Um, let, let me just focus on two or three very brief points. Um, perhaps first of all, a little bit of background about the school. Um, we have about a thousand students. Uh, it's the British school in Tokyo and it genuinely is in Tokyo, right in the heart of Tokyo. And uh, one of our campuses, we're spread across two campuses, is literally two minutes walk from that famous Shibuya scramble crossing that's on all the postcards. So it really is in the heart of, of a a very dynamic city uh, and Tokyo is a very well-developed technological centre uh, in, in the world really um, so technology plays an important part in what we do. Over the last three or four years some of the really big changes uh, big big focus on mobile technology um, clearly we're, we're seeing uh, to some extent the end of the bookable computer room and our students tend to take things with them wherever they go, a whole range of devices. So big investment in tech infrastructure in the school, bandwidth and, and Wi-Fi uh, accessibility and robustness of that system, absolutely vital. Uh, if we move to a more sort of human side of technology, uh, we've, we're finding we're spending an awful lot more on tech-related CPD for our staff. Uh, they have to know what they're doing, they have to keep up to speed with what's happening, they have to feel confident uh, using the technology. And linked to that, a lot more parental engagement related to technology. Um, our parents belong to uh, a different generation, obviously, and uh, they need a lot of information, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of reassurance that we're heading in the right sort of direction. Uh, I suppose the other really important area is uh, the gathering of data, the management of data, the sharing of data, uh, the analysis of data. Data is everywhere. So it, as a school administrator, uh, again, we invest quite a lot in that sort of data management, data handling, data gathering. Um, and that's only going to continue, I think. I could talk about an awful lot of other things. Um, clearly, one of the things that's happening is that we're, we're probably investing less in the, the desktop PC. We're spending a fortune on robotics kits, uh, spending a fortune on quite specialized technology in areas like music, art, uh, in uh, areas like photography. Um, so that's, that's been a significant change. Next three or four years, I haven't got a clue. It's, <laughs> it's moving so fast. Um, and for that reason, I would say, again, as a school, we're focused a lot more on our digital strategy. Um, you know, four or five years ago, the idea of having a digital strategist on the senior leadership team was, was you know, really groundbreaking. Now, they're almost essential. Um, you can, as you probably well know, waste an awful lot of money by going down blind alleys. And having somebody with real experience within that, the senior leadership of the school helping us to make decisions and helping us to develop a vision is, is vital. I think that continued parental engagement is going to be very, very important. Um, I'm really interested in technology and well-being, uh, technology in, and uh, the, the physical fitness of our students as well as their, their mental fitness. Uh, and I think that partnership with parents is going to be vital. And uh, I think, again, thirdly, so much in so many exciting areas, you know, robotics, AI, all that side of things. Not sure where it's taking us, uh, but certainly very exciting for schools. Certainly a lot of potential for, for wasting a lot of money. So I think uh, we're seeing a much more robust examination of the sort of decision making that we're, we're, we're going through. That's, Is that okay? Yes, yeah, lovely. Thanks very much indeed, Brian. Yeah. Laura, as part of the Tallinn group of international schools, how are decisions made within your group 
about new technology investment? How do you select what you're going to buy and what about staff development across the group? Right. Um, again, give a bit of background what Talim is about. We're 10 schools in the UAE, nine in Dubai and one in Abu Dhabi. And to add to the difficulty, we have three curriculums. So we have the British curriculum, the IB, and the American. Um, within the group, what we also have set up, we have set up like um, um, heads of technologies across all the group that work as one team, and, and same with every level of the education sector within each school. Um, and within that, what we've done with technology, we've broken into three categories. One is core technology, so like he mentioned, infrastructure, Wi-Fi, connectivity. We try to standardize that across all the schools uh, and um, take the pressure of the schools on, on making sure the connectivity is there. It, it's, it's like having the roadway and making sure the traffic is going through effectively. From then on, we look also at the second layer of, of technology, which is all about how we collect the data from all the different curriculums to make sense, not just from the central office point of view, but from each school, SLT, and the teacher. Um, connectivity is key for us for any applications and any tools that we use, whether it's in a classroom or, um, or even down to the, the, the analysis. Um, and the third level of, of technology is really down to what happens within a classroom. So this is any, any tools that enable the teaching that doesn't need to be data collected, that doesn't need to be um, we don't need to know about from central office, but it enables the student to learn as effective as possible and is an aid to the, to the teachers within the team. And that is all, can all, all go down to the level of the teacher. So they also have a responsibility for, you know, a math teacher can have a, a big say in what technology sure. they want to reuse across the schools and at times across curriculum. Mm. Um, so we get involvement at each level of the schools. And part of that is, uh, at the middle level, is also the development of the staff. Yes. You know, that, that is key for all of them. And I think I've got one of my head of technologies here, and he would say that we do involve uh, teachers all the time, but not just at CPD days, but also continuously. So we try to monitor it. We have a special education team that will go to each school and say, what do we need to do to help you? And that's continuous. I hope okay. that answers your question. That's great. Thanks, Laurel. Duncan, there, there are now so many digital resources supporting teaching and learning. And as we can see here at BET, you know, there's so many new solutions coming onto the market, aren't there? So how do you choose new resources and what do you really want from technology suppliers in terms of product, but also school support? Um, so, so everybody else is giving you a bit of a background, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background first about, about Brighton College, if that's okay, quickly. Um, so, uh, I'm at Brighton College in Abu Dhabi. Um, obviously, we have Brighton College in Brighton in the UK, which is our sister school. Uh, we also have Brighton College in Alain, uh, which is also in the Emirates of Abu Dhabi. Um, we have new uh, Brighton College coming in um, Dubai in September. Um, we also have a Brighton College in Bangkok. Now, the model that, that uh, uh, Brighton College is based on internationally is, is based on working with local uh, um, companies, as, as sort of mentioned in the, in the presentation before, if you saw. So we, we have a, a, a group called Bloom Education, who, who own and manage the Brighton Colleges uh, in the UAE. So it's a slightly uh, understanding the, the, the structure. In terms of uh, uh, how we, what we look for and how we, in terms of technology and how we, how we get it, it's, it's quite a challenge, really, because uh, obviously being in Abu Dhabi, that we, having access to new developments seeing, you know, having the opportunity to come to places like this and see uh, you know, a range of products that you can compare and, and look at is, is quite, quite challenging. Um, a lot of it is, is done through networking, as, as again the, the, the report sort of suggested, in terms of talking to people in other schools in, in the region, uh, finding out what they're using, how, how well it's working or, or, or not. Um, in terms of what we want from suppliers, uh, it's, it's, it's very much uh, against the sort of the box shifting kind of element. What, what, what we want is we want uh, suppliers that will work with us, that will support us, uh, will provide training, um, will provide uh, technical support. Um, so it's more of an, a, a rounded package rather than somebody that will just provide us with the technology. Um, 
because yeah, you, you can be sort of, although the UAE is, is quite a, a large country, it can be sort of quite isolating in, in terms of the whole breadth of, of uh, technology that, that's available really. Mm. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Jamie, COBIS is one of the many associations supporting international schools. How do technology suppliers know which associations to align with? And what can an international school association like COBIS do to support tech suppliers, um, tech suppliers who wish to develop their business with international schools? Just to give you a little bit of a background on COBIS as well, we're the Council of British International Schools. We represent just under 300 British schools in 80 countries worldwide. Um, we've been going now for about 37 years, so we have a long history in the sector. Um, so most associations worldwide will have an offering for companies, edtech companies, whereby they introduce your services to international schools, and, and Corpus is no different. How you would decide then how, which association to align with is um, basically to look at your export st strategy and look at what schools you're targeting, and then also do your research into what the associations, the schools they represent. So for example, Cobus represents British schools. You also have CIS who uh, represent international schools. There is regional associations like BSME who work with British schools in the Middle East. Um, we have another association called Phobosia who work with schools in Asia. So it's really down to what you're offering um, and what sort of schools you're aiming your product at. For example, if your product is for primary British curriculum, you want to work with an association who represents primary schools. Um, if your service or product is um, for the British curriculum, you'll obviously be want, want to work with an association who represents British schools rather than an association who represents the wider international school community, American curriculum, IB, so on. Um, the practical ways that uh, Cobus works with edtech companies and suppliers is um, traditionally we, our, our membership was uh, solely international schools. Um, a few years ago we introduced a membership tier called supporting membership and that's for companies and suppliers who want to do business with British international schools. So suppliers, many of them are here today, can, you can actually join Cobus now as a member and in return for that subscription we help to make introductions to our international schools. And that's done um, through numerous different ways, um, really via a lot of digital channels. So we host a, a series of webinars where you can introduce your product to our international schools. Uh, you can also uh, design and publish an email campaign that we send to our international schools. You can um, contribute to our blog on the website. Um, and then really, in terms of all the digital stuff, there's, there's no replacement for face-to-face um, -face contact. So then supporting members get priority access to our annual conference, which brings together uh, hundreds of international school leaders in London every May. Um, and that, they're the kind of introductions that we would make for companies like yourselves. That's great. Thanks very much, Jamie. Brian, could I come back to you again? And I wonder if you could share three quick tips that are, might be relevant for technology suppliers um, about international schools. I'm thinking about what makes them different, perhaps, to state or independent schools uh, in the supplier's own local country. A lot of the answers that I would share now probably shone through in the, in the BISA research that you, you saw a few moments ago. Um, perhaps the most important thing of all is to do your homework. Um, I think that's vital. Um, there are different regulations in different countries around the world. There are different uh, cultural standpoints, uh, a whole range of different things that you need to consider. Um, and it's absolutely vital, I, I think, that that homework is done because one of the things that uh, comes across my desk is, is that we get lots and lots of, of um, unsolicited emails, lots and lots of inquiries, people wanting to sell us things. And when it becomes very clear that they don't know who we are, they don't know how, what, how Japan is different from other countries, then it, it's, it's hard for me to respond positively to that. I, I want to work with somebody who, who has done that bit of homework. Um, it can be really big picture stuff. You know, you know that if you're trying to export to the Middle East, there are going to be you know, very significant cultural or religious differences you've got to be aware of. Um, but they can also be much smaller things. Um, in Japan, for example, we, we work on a different voltage. Doesn't affect a lot of the technology. Does affect some. We had a wonderful situation just a few months ago where we thought we'd discovered this absolutely brilliant laptop charging trolley. 
wonderful design, look just what we were looking for. Asked the company, is it okay, different voltage, Japan, blah, 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 it was coming from the States. They said, yeah, we've done our research, absolutely fine, got to customs in Japan, wouldn't let it through. Didn't meet their, their health and safety standards. Weren't gonna let it happen. Uh, we got a refund, but <laughs> just, just one of those examples. So do the research is, is, is very, very important, I think. Um, another thing, I probably would say this, because I'm a, a member of the, the COBIS board, but I do think it's very, very helpful to link in with, with one or more of the membership associations. Uh, again, one of the things that, that happens a lot, it's, it's usually our teachers who drive what, our innovation. And you know, they're always coming along and saying, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do something else. The first thing I want is reassurance that, that what they're suggesting is going to work, that it's effective, it's proved positive elsewhere. And, and I'll be straight you know, on email, I'll, I'll contact another member of the Japan Council of International Schools. That's, that's our sort of national organization for international schools. Uh, or I'll get on to COBIS. Um, I'm sure it's exactly the same for members of uh, Fabicia or, or BSME. Uh, we want that reassurance. There's, there's often a lot of money changing hands here. It's a big investment, and we need the reassurance of somebody else who's, who's worked with a particular company. I, I think that's absolutely vital as well. And then a the third thing, it, it again came through in the research, support uh, and timely support. Um, we feel quite isolated uh, in Japan from many other British schools. We're the only school in Japan offering uh, the British curriculum all the way through from primary to A-level. Um, and because we're surrounded by a, a lot of other America-orientated, US-orientated schools, we sometimes feel we're a bit separate from the rest of the world. Um, nine hours time difference between London and Tokyo. Um, we need timely support. Uh, and the companies who have offices or connections in at least our, our sort of area of Asia are the ones we tend to go for most easily. So uh, really sell the support side of things. I think that's vital. Okay. Yep, yeah, lovely. Thanks very much. Duncan, as an international school, what are your three biggest challenges uh, when it comes to digital resources? Um, probably the, the, the first real challenge um, is once we've actually got the technology in place, is, is providing good quality training. Um, particularly with British curriculum, um, a lot of uh, schools internationally have to ship out trainers from, from the UK, um, which obviously is costly and expensive. There are trainers in, in, the, in the UAE, but for specialised things, that, that's, that can be a challenge. And getting, it, it sometimes means working with people like BSME, Colbis, to sort of you know, pull together training with a, with a group of schools. Yeah. Um, so yeah, good quality training um, when it's required, it, it can, be, can be quite a challenge. Okay. Um, access to um, ranges of technology, um, whether it be software, whether it be uh, hardware, uh, infrastructure, can, can also be a challenge in terms of uh, being able to see and, and, and test drive and trial, trial technologies. Um, and, and also, I, I think in terms of procurement, and again, it touched on it in the, in the report, the, the, the procurement process can be a lengthy and, and quite challenging one at some, sometimes um, because of, uh, I think, and it, I would suggest in different countries as well, culturally and, and uh, historically, uh, the processes that you have to go through in terms of you know, putting together um, requisitions and putting together, you know, um, um, actually purchasing orders and, and that, that, that process can take months in, in, some, in some occasions and the, the structure of the schools depending on whether it's a not-for-profit school or a, a for-profit school uh, can also make that challenging as well. So you, I think you mentioned before that you may have a, a, a head of history who, who found a, a brilliant piece of software that's going to really support what they're doing. It then has to go through a, a load of stages in order for them to actually purchase that software which can take time and, and be challenging, so yeah. Please. Right, okay, that's something. Thanks very much indeed. Now, could I ask you, what, what are the three essential requirements uh, you think you need from technology suppliers? Um, I think both uh, Duncan and Brian have touched base on what we're looking for from technology partners. Um, you know, suppliers do send information to us saying, this is the technology we need, and 
trying to push technology and not really understanding what we're all about. Yeah. And having 10 schools and, and three curriculums, certain technologies may not fit. It's not a fit for all. Um, so understanding what we're about and what the school is about and how we're teaching is, is key. So when we look at suppliers, the first thing we look at is a partner, someone who is willing to come with us and understand our problems um, and try and find a solution, the right solution for us. Um, we're looking at that. We have, we're starting to get close partners now whereby they're not um, vendor-centric or anything like that. They will try and find the right solution for us right. and they deal with all the rest. Um, secondly, and I think again mentioned support. Support is key. You know, yeah. We've been down the road whereby we've purchased products, but the support is in America. We're in the UAE. You know, uh, our technicians or any staff have to be up till uh, five o'clock in the evening, till eight o'clock in the evening to get the support. Um, local support is key for us. You know, if something goes wrong. We can't afford to have children or staff not being able to learn or have that platform of, of learning. Um, and thirdly, really, it, it, it is down to cost as well, because whatever investment we, we put into the technology, you know, we need to think about, okay, what else are we going to miss if we invest that amount of money? So cost is, is key, but also having the ability to have the proof of concept. So a lot of suppliers do work with us and say, okay, let's pick one of our schools Let's prove the technology is working, often more than not, free of charge. Right. You know? um, and they can do that for a year. Um, and that's vital because that really gives us the important information. Is that technology working? No, let's try something else. And now you said the kind of three things we do look at. And, and has that proof of concept been enabled better through the partners that you've established? And who, who might those partners be? Uh, partners in the UAE can be a, a multi-vendor partner. Um, that will enable us, especially also for STEM. You know, we've got a couple of vendors that deal with the cross uh, alliances. Um, and actually, we're doing a, a workshop in a, in a couple of weeks where we're inviting all the schools, our schools, to attend that. And there will be all kinds of technology. I think it will be based more about Lego, I believe. But it's all about, it's all proof of concept. And it will not cost us anything. Um, so, oh, well, I, was, I, I asked you who the partners were oh, and um, yeah, what sort of partners. But on a technology is. front, um, you know, we do work with Microsoft a lot. But again, we have to work through a vendor. We can't work directly with them. Right. So it is vendors that can either be Microsoft, Apple, Google. Right. You know, we don't want to be technology focused. We want to be open minded to yeah. what is the best technology that will fit the problem yeah. that we so need. So it's to vendors who are prepared to spend time up front with you. Correct. Um, put some resource into it before Correct. the final buying decision Correct. might be made. We're more problem solving rather than find the yes. technology and try and fit a square yes. box on the round hole. You know, Great. It doesn't work that way. Okay, that's lovely. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, Jamie, if I could ask you, the, the international school market is very diverse. I mean, we've, we've, we've touched on that already, haven't we? So, as a technology supplier wishing to develop their business with international schools, what three quick tips can you offer? to help them target their sales and marketing efforts in the best possible way? Okay, um, I'd say firstly, I would encourage um, EdTech companies to, to look at emerging markets in developing countries. Um, through working with a lot of uh, companies who perhaps have only had clients in the UK in the past and have then gone into the international market, they automatically look to the Middle East first and that's absolutely no disrespect. That's a really, really good strategy to have because, as we know, the schools in the Middle East are very well resourced and, and the parents that send their kids to schools in the Middle East are very affluent. That's a good strategy. But there are a lot of schools in more developing countries that are crying out for high-quality vendors and who are perhaps in isolated areas where they just don't have the access to really good ed tech companies and suppliers. Um, for example... The, the two countries where the most COBA schools are on earth are Nigeria and Romania. Um, British education is taken off there. So they're not necessarily two countries that you might think about when you think about selling to British schools overseas, but they're, they're two countries that are ones to watch um, alongside countries in Eastern Europe, Slovakia, Poland, Latvia. Um, so p do think about the, I think the um, emerging markets and developing countries. Um, secondly, I would say is, is a question of perseverance, really. And, and just to remember that it, working with international schools, it, it never happens overnight. And we, we have a lot of um, companies come to us and, and they join Cobus. And you know, after six months, they say, oh, we don't have any international school clients. What's going on? 
but you know from my experience it can take years it, it can take years to, to get a, a foothold in the market and it takes it takes years of just coming to conferences um, meeting with heads when you can um, you know availing of the digital opportunities that I mentioned like webinars blogs email campaigns um, so you really kind of have to give it a lot of work before you begin to see um, a return on investment really um, and thirdly I think is is sort of linked to that point as well is is to think digital I think that edtech companies are in a really privileged position that um, with a lot of your products you can demonstrate them online and you can demonstrate them without having to be face to face with an international school head now that's not to say that face to face is invaluable because we all know that that's you know more powerful than anything um, but when you're you're entering um, an international schools market for the first time I, I would think about as I mentioned things like webinars for example, we can have 100 international schools online to watch a demonstration by a company um, you know, every week. Um, and that can create an unbelievable amount of leads for you just from a one-hour webinar that you know, is very cost-effective and certainly more cost-effective than you know, paying your staff to go travel to the other side of the world um, for a meeting. Now that, as I said, is not to say that face-to-face -face doesn't matter because once you make the connection and once your um, schools become aware of your brand, after appealing to them through a digital channel, you can then follow that up with meeting them at a conference in London or um, during an international trip. So that would be my, my three tips, I think. That's great. Yeah. Could, could I just jump in there a second, Jamie? Um, webinars are fantastic, and uh, we use them a lot. But uh, Jamie talked there about uh, having 100 international schools watching a webinar where you're demonstrating a product. To be honest, um, I'm not interested uh, in logging on to a webinar most of the time to see somebody demonstrate a product. Um, the best bit of advice I can give is don't try and sell us a product, don't try and sell us a bit of kit, a bit of software, sell us a solution, sell us an answer. And the, the webinars that, that I log on to and the ones that most of my staff log on to, it's because a company somewhere has identified uh, an issue that we have and they've come up with an answer that will make our lives easier. And the webinar, is, is not to demonstrate the product, of course it is, but essentially what it's billed as something that's giving us an answer to a problem we're trying to find our way around. And uh, some of those, to be honest, have been absolutely fantastic. You, you, you log on and you see that somebody has identified a real issue that's relevant to your school and they've got a, something, a bit of kits, a, a bit of software, whatever, that really is going to help. And those, that sort of impact is, is quite telling, and, and certainly that's led to a, to a lot of purchases from our end. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed, and I'd like to, to thank all the panellists as well. Duncan Silcock from Brighton College in Abu Dhabi, Brian Christian from the British School of Tokyo, Jamie Ralph, Communications Officer at Cobis, and Laurent Fauville, who's Head of Digital Learning at Tali. Thank you very much indeed.